Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lauren, for the introduction, and just have a great opportunity to welcome everybody here. My name is Mark Wong, and I'm a senior lecturer in public policy and research methods at the University of Glasgow. And I'm also leading the Innovators Assemble project together with Dr. Tim Peacock here, with Laura, uh, Lauren Watson, Rachel Porteous, and this uh, fireside chat was also supported uh, by Dr. Helen uh, Millen. So just and um, just really huge thank you to everyone for coming. We have more coming as well. We had one uh, just a couple of months ago uh, in person uh, uh, as well uh, as uh, we have uh, some of the discussions with some of the, the academics in this area already, um, including Dr. Blair Anderson, Dr. Daisy Abbott, and also uh, Sandy Tarbett uh, from Dundee. So really just happy to just, well, please uh, keep in touch this project. We also have uh, in, in our own work that we have uh, co-created a game together with uh, Education Evolve, which is our industry partner, but also the, and also the community organization, Ethnic Minority Environmental Network, and local artists of floating designers. So these are all our project partners that we're very, very grateful for. But we have a game, game launch for our game seven, Seven Voices, One Future, which highlights minoritized ethnic people's perspectives and the sustainable futures in Scotland. So if you want to come, that is 19th of May, uh, 12 to 3 p.m. at the Advanced Research Centre uh, in Glasgow. More details if you want to message me. Uh, and we have another fireside chat coming up uh, with uh, our very own uh, Dr. Matt Barr. Uh, also, uh, in, in a few weeks' time, but we'll tell you more details later. But for now, just a huge thank you to everybody. Thank you for the, to the funders as well. And thank you to Brendan for really um, sparing his time with us. So thank you very much. I'll hand back to Lauren. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, figure that out. Um, but yeah, no, many thanks for that, Mark. It's great to hear about in the same. And uh, the games, the Aspect Games Hub, which I refer to, is also delighted to be collaborating with NSM on this project. Um, but yeah, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our esteemed guest, Brendan Keogh, um, who will give a quick presentation on uh, his work and just kind of introduce our, our chat, get, get, our, get our subject matter going. Many thanks. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Mark. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, and anyone who's watching the recording later, thank you as well. Um, I'm going to screen share. If, give me one second. Um, and spoilers. Cool. I'm going to make that tiny so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, cool. So I thought I would just give a brief, like, 15-minute, if that, overview of um, my my recent book and my research in this area, um, keeping it fairly um, broad level, kind of surface level, superficial, and then, you know, drill down into the actual details in, in question time, um, discussing with Lauren and with the rest of you. Um, I thought that would be the best way to do this. Um, I'm going to put a little timer on just because I'm very bad at, at this. Um, and I don't want to be that person at the conferences everyone complains about afterwards. Cool. Um, so, oh God, now my brightness has disappeared. Cool. Right. So first of all, um, even though I've been talking for a while, um, just want to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people um, in Mianjin, Brisbane, um, and pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, acknowledge this is land that was never ceded and was in fact stolen. And in Australia, we like to um, acknowledge that regularly, um, even though we don't do a whole lot about it. Um, so yeah, look, my new book is called The Video Game Industry Does Not Exist, Why We Should Think Beyond Commercial Game Production. Apologies to anyone who needs to reference that in a journal article where your bibliography counts to your word limit. Um, I tried not to. Um, and yeah, let's, let's talk about that. So as a way of segue into the themes of a book, I thought I'd maybe introduce myself a bit more. Um, that bio um, that Lauren read out made me sound incredibly impressive. So I like, I like that a lot. Um, but yeah, look, I've been a researcher of video game production and play cultures is how I generally try to um, put it in a sentence. Back during my PhD um, and afterwards, I was very focused on, I guess, games as texts and how do we critically analyze games and really meaningful and nuanced ways. Um, but in, in that research, I in no way looked at the people who made games or kind of these material artifacts that are the games themselves was entirely focused on just these kind of, I guess, content, for lack of a better word. Um, and so I got really interested in the years following my PhD on like for people who make these games. In part because I was teaching game development at a small college, a uh, very vocationally minded kind of place. 
And I was also just hanging out with a lot of game developers. Um, the Melbourne scene was really popping off in the early 2010s. So I was seeing a lot of game developers. Um, I helped co-organize this group called the Squiggly River Game Collective once I moved back to Brisbane. Started making my own little hobby games. Um, last year, I released this little game you can see on the side, Brendan Keogh's Putting Challenge um, on Steam, my first proper, you know, proper, we'll talk about that, um, Steam release. And, and I've always kind of been around as a game critic and journalist. The idea during my PhD was, let's see what pays off first, being a game journalist or a um, academic. And so I think we saw pretty clearly there that um, it was being... It tells you how dire of a game journalism situation is if being an academic is one that paid off for me. Um, but yeah, so among all of this, been making my own games as well. And, and I guess the TLDR of all of this way of bio intro is that I've done a lot. I do a lot of stuff around games. I hang out with a lot of games people. Um, I do research, but I'm also just kind of around, I guess. And because I'm around a lot, that means I've spoken at several game developer conferences in San Francisco, um, GCAP conferences in Melbourne and others. And because I've spoken at those conferences or been on juries for awards, I'm also regularly asked, you know, to fill out their annual survey um, as a, you know, like as a game developer, essentially, please fill out this survey on the state of the industry that GDC does every year. And so we know what the industry looks like. And so particularly now I have a game on Steam, like they literally sent me this email inviting me to fill this out. I feel like I'm clearly the right person to fill this out. And then I start filling it out and all the questions are things like, how many people work at your company? Um, one, um, do you work remotely or in an office? It's like I use a MacBook on the couch while my partner watches Bridgerton. Um, how many hours a week do you work? And I'm like, well, sometimes two, sometimes 10, because it's not my job. It's just a thing I do sometimes, making games. And so I got really interested in who is filling out these surveys and who isn't. Um, I felt like a lot of the data in these kind of um, reports that be are put out by different industry lobby groups and associations reflect a very particular idea of the game industry, which I think for me often has very little connection or, or, or a large disconnection rather with the people I knew who were making games just in weird little communities or in their own time. And they were often presented in this research as being driven by like the desire to start a company and grow that company larger, like a tech startup, when the people I knew were often just making something with their friends, it accidentally went viral. And now all of a sudden they're making a commercial video game, much more like a small band that kind of um, has a big hit and suddenly finds out that's their full-time job now, as opposed to say a film recording studio, which is a company from day one. So I felt like there was this disconnect between um, how we talk about the game industry and how the game industry, how game developers themselves kind of understand their craft, their identity and what they do and where they do it. Um, so that led me down a kind of Bordersian kind of um, route, which is a problem because I don't know how to say French names. Um, but he's got this great quote, which kind of gets at exactly what I'm talking about here in his uh, um, chapter or article, The Field of Cultural Production, where he says in his very French convoluted way that every survey aimed at establishing the hierarchy of cultural producers predetermines the hierarchy by determining the population deemed worthy of helping to establish it. So the fact I felt uncomfortable filling out a GDC survey, that I felt like maybe I wasn't the right kind of game developer and I was, you know, poisoning the well by putting in my, my bad data, kind of like, so I just didn't fill it out in the end. It means we have these surveys that tell us that the game industry looks a certain way, but that's because a certain kind of game developer is being encouraged to fill out those surveys. So I, I guess wanted to go beyond the surveys and be like, well, what else is happening out there? How can we capture that? Um, which led me to kind of these kinds of questions of like, who is a game developer? Who is in the video game industry? Um, and yeah, who are we missing? What activities and practices are we missing as well? So ultimately, I guess TLDR, fast forward five years, I have a book that does that. It's called The Video Game Industry Does Not Exist. Um, yeah, I've, I'm not spending another five minutes saying the title. Um, I, I, I went and just interviewed a lot of people is, is the answer. Like, how can I get beyond these surveys? I had a sense of who was out there. And so I went out and interviewed accidentally almost 200 people, mostly in Australia, but also in uh, Montreal, the, in the Montreal, in, in Montreal, in the US, um, a couple of in Southeast Asia, but the pandemic kind of put an end to that, sadly. 
Um, but really deliberately trying to get the people who are hobbyists, who are part-time, who are doing kind of non or well, less creative client work, and really just kind of deliberately trying to get stories that challenge or interrupt the way we understand the game industry. Um, and to do that, try to point towards a broader, what I call the field of video game production, by which I mean, again, in a very Bordeaux kind of way, it's a cultural field. And it's this cultural field that surrounds and kind of has to pre-exist the game industry. Um, if games are art, if game developers are artists, as you know, we all like to kind of claim all the time to try to convince our parents we have real jobs or we're researching a real thing, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of actual consequences of such a claim. Like if the game industry works like an art sector or an art field or an art world, rather than say a tech industry or a purely kind of economic or commercial world, then that leads to different questions and it leads to different answers in terms of who is doing it, why they're doing it, the particular kind of economic and social challenges they face doing it, et cetera. And so I guess this research isn't about just saying the arty stuff is more important. It's not about saying, Games are art, man. Like, take it seriously. It, it's really just saying the way this, in, this industry works, if it is an industry, it, it is a cultural industry. And that comes with all sorts of really fundamental constitutive contradictions and complications that it's very easy to kind of miss and put the cart before the horse if we just start with looking at companies and if we just start with looking at what is commercially viable and successful. Um, I guess another way of putting that is video game production had to exist before it was industrialized. It didn't just start as an industry. There had to be an activity beforehand. So I guess the kind of way I think through this framework very broadly, um, and this was my title before MIT Press said it was boring, um, was that, there had, and, and I guess I should say too, when I say video game production, I mean that in the terms of cultural production, not in the narrow way it's often used by video game developers themselves as like a, a project management role. So you could replace video game production here with game making if you wish. Um, so video game production existed before it was industrialized and formalized. There were hobbyists, there were students, there were people doing weird stuff before it was an industry. It exists below the industry as like still today as the foundations on which the industry is kind of built. It's, it's towers, you know, it's where skills come from. It's where ideas come from. It's where innovation comes from. The cities that have tens of thousands of game developers like Montreal had a scene before they had an industry. Like um, I remember who was I talking to? Jason Della Rocca, I think, who said Ubisoft isn't just going to plant a studio in the desert and name it Ubisoft Desert. There needs to be people to actually hire there or at least a culture that's going to attract people. So like the video game production has to exist in a location before the industry can build on it. And video game production exists beyond the industry, beyond the kind of economic confines or, or metrics of the industry. It, like it, it's not, it can't be contained in just the industry. It goes beyond that in terms of intersections with the art world, transferable skills into other sectors. Um, interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, and I guess the point I would want, like, say, policymakers and funders and governments to take away from this, which are not going to be too on board with it, just fund it because it's real art, is that even if you want to fund it for more, say, neoliberal reasons of jobs and growth, um, you still need to understand it fundamentally as a cultural industry underpinned by kind of cultural practice and identities, which I think I was meant to say on a different slide. Um, so I make the polemic claim, video game industry doesn't exist. That's obviously more of a kind of clickbaity polemic rather than a objective thing. Made writing the book incredibly annoying because I couldn't save a video game industry. Um, but the point I mean, I mean, I'm trying to make there is we can save a cultural industry. And when we talk about save a music industry, we can easily understand that includes bands, garage bands and cover bands and Taylor Swift and Lady Gaga. Whereas video game industry kind of industrialized before we had a sense of a field that exists beyond the, the industry. And so we've, we kind of, that industry, that word is kind of preemptively limiting for video games in a way it arguably may or may not be for, for other cultural industries, as some of my interviewees got to. Um, this one who works primarily in the theatre industry, uh, theatre sector, if you will, um, felt okay with saying the, the theatre industry, but they felt very wrong saying the video game industry as the location where they were working. Um, but I, I guess I, I want to go beyond the semantic argument. Hopefully this book doesn't just go down in history as the semantic argument of the video game industry doesn't exist, but more trying to think how is that being 
conceptually and discursively limiting us to to actually seriously think about video game making and video game expression and video game genres and play in with as much complexity and contradictions and respect as we can think of film and music and art, et cetera. Um, I guess the main kind of theoretical way I frame this in the book, historically, like essentially why is it like this? Why do we struggle to talk about video games? The, like the same way, we like my parents very easily understand that film isn't just Marvel movies, but they probably don't understand that video games aren't just Call of Duty, right? Or they'll say they don't play video games, but if I look at their smartphone, they'll have 10 or 20 on there. And so there's, I won't go into it in detail, but I theorize in a book that from the mid 80s till about the mid 2000s, the game, the video game field went through this period of aggressive formalization or it was aggressively formalized in that after the kind of US Atari crash that we all know pretty well, I think, and Nintendo came along with its seal of approval, there was a concerted effort to kind of narrow what game development was seen as legitimate game development. Um, and that was done discursively through game journalism, Nintendo power, the constitution of like the gamer identity. Um, it was done technologically through software development kits, um, patented lock and key systems. Um, and it was done legally by those systems being patented. If you put your game on an NES and you weren't using Nintendo's hardware to do that, they would sue you for duplicating their hardware. Um, Casey O'Donnell's The Developer Dilemma explores this incredibly well and it's really the foundation from which I kind of developed these theories. And so through the 90s and 2000s, the industry became synonymous with the field because despite the existence of modding and flash games, this is what you could see was, was industrial games. And that's when kind of game studies emerges at the same time. And so that's kind of broken down in more recent decades, thanks to digital distribution, platformization, indie development more broadly, the rise of Unity and Unreal, it's no longer it's no longer impossible it's no longer possible to hide this broader kind of patchwork of weird stuff in, in fact it's much easier for the largest companies to to monetize that kind of hobbyist and aspirational labor without formalizing it and so now we're in a situation where it's actually very blurred and confusing who is professional and who is amateur what's work what's a hobby what is even play and what is labor if you're using roblox are you a player or a worker no Man's Sky is a classic example, was made by on average six people, got um, treated as if it was a triple A game. And so was evaluated in a very certain way in the press. Uh, this is my last slide, Lauren, I'm gonna shut up in a second. Um, and so that's for like, how did it end up like this? And then I've got, I guess, so what, why does it matter? As I keep asking my PhD students in much more polite words than that, um, but like, why do we need to think beyond commercial game production, which is my subtitle? Um, and I guess to kind of allude to an answer to that question, um, Australia's Labor government has just earlier this year put out um, a cultural policy. Um, first one since the last time we had a Labor government, a very, very long time ago, the, um, the Liberals, our Tories have been in charge, in charge um, ostensibly for a very long time. Um, and part of, and they call this revive, which is very much a subtweet to the fact that the previous, the conservatives demolished or at the very, at the very best ignored the cultural sector um, for about a decade. Um, and in, in this cultural policy, um, there's this really clear explicit pillar, one of the five pillars of it, or maybe six pillars, is to recognize the artist as a worker, you know, in terms of like minimum wage, workplace, health and safety, all these things. And it's not explicit in here, but one part of that is, I think, if we're acknowledging the artist as a worker, it means explicitly acknowledging the unique situation of art work or of which game work I think fits into, that you can't just read a market and make something for it. It comes down to complex ideation and community and iteration in very nonlinear ways that requires particular kinds of support and funding. And just because you had a very successful game with four people doesn't mean you're going to hire 50 more people after that. Um, so how do we support the games industry or, or field um, as a cultural industry or field, not just simply as this like um, creative artsy looking tech sector um, that like looks good on a brochure for a, for a startup hub? Um, how, like, how do we put the horse back in front of a cart, I suppose? And hopefully my work pointing out that it is actually in fact a cultural field goes somewhere to starting that conversation. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, that's all I have as way of introduction and I'll shut up.
No, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation, Brendan. That was that was really good. I mean, it's interesting as well that you referenced No Man's Sky because I recall um oh, what's the name? Internet Historian's documentary on how it was made and the the wave mm -hmm. of change in the perception of that game's production and the comments. People were mm. nowhere near as hot once they actually found out the conditions in which it was produced and they actively expressed regret, which is rare on the internet, but they actually mm. expressed regret about how they behaved when they found out it was more of an indie team. So that point about like kind of artists as workers is particularly salient. Uh, and I'm gonna ask you about it in our interview portion now. Uh, but yeah, many mm. thanks again for that for that brilliant interview um sorry that Thank brilliant uh, presentation <laughs> but yeah so um my first question to you is much of your scholarship concerns the reframing of any kind of video game production sector towards more grassroots creators hobbyists and independent developers you covered it a little bit in your presentation but can you talk a little bit more about uh, kind of your background especially in reference to your book mm. and how this became a sort of recurring theme of interest to you throughout your work yeah for sure I guess like it, it initially became a theme probably in some ways way back doing my PhD in Melbourne around 2012 to 2015. And around that time, there was a lot of complex stuff happening in game development, both in Melbourne and in Australia, um, in terms of the global financial crisis had demolished the industry here, just absolutely demolished it. And it was mobile games and indie games that kind of had to build up in, in the place of it. Um, and so in Melbourne in the early 2010s, I was hotbed of just incredibly exciting kind of creative stuff going on amongst a lot of kind of really fringe arty stuff that was never going to make money but also that was kind of clashing with a lot of the mobile devs um and everyone was calling themselves indie whether they were commercial or non-commercial there was a lot of kind of conflations of identity in really fascinating way and globally well globally in north america at the same time especially around 2012 there was this kind of re renaissance sounds wanky but like essentially a <laughs> renaissance especially around like yeah. twine of like um marginal game developers especially queer developers and especially yeah. trans women based in oakland um sure. using using twine using um other tools to really to make games like we hadn't really seen for a very long time that were clearly incredibly important and clearly good games doing good stuff but in no way fit any of the boxes us as critics or academics have been told how games were meant to work there was very little choice very little interactivity very little visuals and these things were just fundamentally challenging how we understood games were meant to work and, and so for me just seeing kind of these people hanging out with these people at parties at gdc or at, in melbourne um and then just like and then reading the literature the academic or industry about how the game industry supposedly works and being like but that, that is just so contradictory to how I understand it. And that then obviously, when I was teaching game development dedicatedly for a couple of years after my PhD, and these students would come in with very particular ideas of, um, um, I'll get I'll get a degree, then I'll go get a job. And I'm like, that's, that's not how it works. Like <laughs> I, I did creative writing in undergrad, I did poetry. Like you don't just get a poetry degree and then go wait till someone hires you as a poet, you just start making stuff. And hope that university is also somewhere that does that stuff. I think I'm preempting other questions, but but yeah, I guess all of those things kind of um, came together. Just that, that general dissonance of how game development was being talked about, and what I was seeing in Australia particularly, but on Twitter, just in the indie community, and wanting to and being like, there's something more complicated happening here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I mean, on on that discussion of um, let's say more indie developers and um, let's say uh, worker precarity was a central concern mm -hmm. in your book and the video game industry does not exist uh, especially in the context of the smaller developers not striving for the contemporary fixation on exponential company growth and um, could you talk a little bit about that and ways that funding from whatever source could support you know more longevity or stability for independent or smaller games facilitating that kind of more creative side mm -hmm. yeah totally um, yeah, I guess firstly, why precarity is such a big part of it. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, I had an answer. Um, yeah, I, I guess like <laughs> you're saying part of part of the like dissonance in terms of a previous question is how we always hear the game industry, especially in, like policy documents when the government wants to actually justify supporting it, is how much how they make one hundred fifty billion dollars. They're like bigger than films and music combined. Like all mm -hmm. these kind of big money making kind of claims. Um, you know, if we could just attract Ubisoft here, they'll make, we'll get thousands of jobs and all of this. Um, and, and like those kind of promises, I think, 
Australian developers are particularly cynical of because the global financial crisis happened. It wasn't cheap to make games here and all those big companies left. They didn't, they, they couldn't care less about the local workers that were just here because it was the cheapest place to hire English speaking workers. Um, and, and so like, I guess really just trying to expose that like, as, as I think Robert Yang, game developer says, is like, um, you know, games are art because most developers are making barely any money. And, and that's, and, and so the dissonance of it, one of the reasons it's hard to understand game development as a cultural field is because of these myths that everybody's rich, everybody's making heaps of money, all the games are made in these studios of thousands and thousands of people. When in reality, if you look at the, those GDC, GDC state of the industry surveys, um, or local kind of games industry surveys in different countries, most studios are like down around five or 10 people. Um, if that, like, the majority of people working in the game industry are probably at the large AAAs. The majority of companies, the majority of, um, yeah, companies or contexts in which different games are made are much, much, much smaller. And so those smaller ones, like cultural creators and other sectors, are either working from savings or they're working from, um, um, well, just entirely in kind around full-time jobs. And all of that kind of reality of work in the game industry disappears, as it did for No Man's Sky for, for Hello Games. Um, very, very visibly, like just the context within these game developers are working, we just often take for granted in a very misconstrued way. So trying, so I'm not trying to paint it all as doom and gloom, but rather just as it's a lot more complicated than, than it looks when we just look at the dollar value of these things. Yeah. Um, in terms of how to maybe support them or I guess grow it more stably, yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I guess I have lots of opinions on these and I've been doing some like assessing for Screen Australia who now have a games fund again, thankfully. Um, and a lot of it, I think, just has to, I, I think the issue in the past has been when, especially here in Australia, when the screen agencies like state or federal level, Screen Australia, Screen Victoria, well, Film Victoria, Screen Queensland, they're the ones who've most commonly gotten involved with games. And often it's with very little institutional knowledge of, of games. They're just they're the ones with screen in the name, video games are on screen. So they're the ones who have to deal with it. And they often see games either relatively limitedly or as primarily being economic, I guess, where they're going to fund Bluey because Bluey is just kind of cool. And that's paid the way that's paid off in terms of, you know, um, what you call it, soft capital or whatever is, is obvious. Um, but like they, they struggle to make the same kind of cultural value understandings of games. Um, and, and so I know speaking to developers who are working on games that have been incredibly popular and the local screen agencies would be like, why didn't they come to us for funding? And then I'll speak to the dev and like, it wanted this whole budget or this whole five-year corporate plan thing. Like, how are you going to hire more people? And they're like, I just want to make my cool little game about a, about a slingshotting spider. <laughs> and, and so like these, these forms often, kind of like the survey, implies this isn't for you. Like, unless you're here as a real, you need the Australian company number, which costs a lot of money to get. And, and so there's just so many strings on attached, attached to it. Whereas if you could just smaller amounts of money, but just spray it at, at the kind of smaller scale people with very few strings attached, some professional development thrown in, some like demands for, um, you know, gender equality and actually, you know, dedicating some of it to indigenous storytelling and stuff like that, obviously to, to, um, but generally just give people money so they can actually then go make things. Um, and really like a really small amount of money can make a massive difference, especially for some of these emerging teams um, without the, how will you, how will you hire 50 people kind of requirements? But yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's really interesting. It sort of echoes um, kind of what, what a little bit of what we talked about before. So, so Brennan Q and I um, actually talked previous um, during another project with Glasgow University, the games, uh, pro the Scottish games ecosystem. And um, we held a couple mm. of workshops, uh, one of which Brennan was a part of. And we actually figured that in Scotland here as well, like we do kind of need that. It's that almost like that base layer of just like kind of being able to fail, being able to experiment. Um, on on that subject of kind of the relationship to the industry, let's say. So part of what um, I, I work on as part of the Asset Games Hub is the games development and commercialization pathway. And it's to help sort of academics making games um, kind of think about or at least consider commercialization or how they would sell a game, you know, just kind of as part of almost to promote kind of project longevity. And I, I, it would, I would be interested to hear what you think about the relationship between sort of the university kind of mode of 
pr production in terms of like kind of mm. research projects or creative research project outputs and commercial games, especially when it comes to like educational game projects. Have you have any thoughts on that or experience in educational game projects? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let me think. I don't have any direct experience on no worries. <laughs> uh, educational game projects. Um, I think uh, I'm going to like, sorry, go sideways to something I go feel like it. I can go actually answer, but like <laughs> one kind of game developer studio I found a lot of in Australia is these companies, it's effectively, again, indie devs, they still would consider right. themselves indie devs, um, but instead of going the original intellectual property approach and just let's see what happens, put all our eggs in this basket, they do client work either for academics who want education games or, yes. you know, soft drink companies who want a marketing game or um, an NGO that wants kind of like a social awareness game mm -hmm. um as a way like because i think like all game developers just like all cultural workers are you know have to navigate cultural well, creative versus commercial kind of values which yeah. are fundamentally kind of irresolvable in many ways yeah. and so they're kind of the ones that sit on the other side of that seesaw they're not the throwing their savings into um 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 just like passion projects but they're like well i really want to make games i don't want to burn me and my team out maybe I can make these marketing games for a while and it'll be less creatively fulfilling but it'll be more commercially sustainable yeah. and, and a lot of those companies do have in Australia like have clients who are academics and some who are interestingly kind of um would articulate kind of getting a social value out of it rather in in rather as a compromise for not getting I guess a cultural or creative value like they get to make a game about how we need to save the Great Barrier Reef or whatnot and that yeah. would kind of fulfill the kind of intrinsic value of their work even while they weren't getting to make you know their game that expressed their narrative ideas or whatnot <laughs> um yeah but I haven't had too much experience of my own academic um making games myself in terms of commercialization um I, I have broader opinions on um serious games and educational games which yeah yeah Netflix, which I can go on about if you want but <laughs> yeah no it'd be great no we will we will 100 discuss that I think First, though, I'd like to ask you just before that, because that is a really important conversation. Um, mm. Fully conscious of universities being seen as perhaps somewhat removed, uh, bourgeois, etc. I'm wondering, you know, how do you think higher, a community's higher education system, let's say, or um, higher education institutions can aid in this issue of precarity or mm -hmm. perhaps help shape students? So that's um, kind of arts, humanities, um kind of social sciences for people in the economy that's what shape stands for um mm -hmm. so in helping shape students to understand the potential roles that this the games field can offer to them mm -hmm. yeah i think um it can, it can both help or hinder in very different ways mm -hmm. i think in with lots of contexts and it's it's a topic you know um higher education for um game development is something game developers talk a lot about themselves there's a lot of mistrust. There's a lot of concern about kind of predatory institutions that like they know these gamers love games. So they're like, hey, come here because you love games and you'll get a degree and then you'll go make games. And in many ways, um, again, the perception amongst game developers of like that misunderstanding or that dissonance between what we understand about games through playing them in popular culture and the actual precarious reality they're made under often leading to kind of this pipeline of students just being pumped out at the other end where they then have to go indie or they have to do this kind of massive hustle to even be employable. Yeah. Um, but, and, and in Australia, that was definitely a massive kind of concern in terms of there was at one point, one of the local industry lobby groups for a Senate inquiry said, and I don't know where they got their numbers from, they said there were 10,000 students in Australia. And I think they were being very generous with the numbers, but even 5,000. <laughs> and even yeah. that was, you know, if it, if it was 5,000, that would be five times the number of um, developers currently yeah. employed in the industry at that time. So there's this idea that there's massive oversupply. But at the same time, there's like massive oversupply of musicians, there's massive oversupply of poets, there's massive oversupply of actors. And like that is often a concern for both parents and for uh, policymakers. But like the students who go and learn poetry or who learn music kind of on some level know what they're getting into and also have a sense like I'll learn poetry then I'll do something else with these skills. And so like the transferable skills stuff kind of becomes very important there as well. Um, but, but I guess for me, like the way, especially on the, I guess, God, there's so many parts of this. Part of it too <laughs> is like, because we often see game development as part of computer science or part of the tech world and not part of the creative world. And in a lot of universities, it was 
the STEM kind of parts of university that kind of shotgun to game development. And we have Bachelor of Game Development degrees in kind of IT programs or, or computer science mm-hmm. programs, as opposed to in design or art schools. And, and often we have both and are just kind of, you know, they run parallel without necessarily collaborating. And so you just get all these kind of complex issues where on the IT computer science side, you're going to get a lot of hard skills um, and you're going to learn about computer programming, but you might not learn about aesthetics or narrative. I'm being very um, broad strokes here, obviously, and vice versa. If you go and do game dev in a kind of art school, which can, will probably teach you concept art and narrative, might not have as many opportunities to teach you, you know, programming of the same level. But for me, it really just comes down to, yeah, like you said before, Lauren, like giving students the opportunity to fail and like trying to get them understanding from day one that they've just enrolled in a creative practice program, whether they mentor or not, that, you know, like, and I would say that in on day one, I'm like, you've just enrolled in the equivalent of a creative writing degree. If you're not okay with that, you've got three weeks before census date and we charge you. So get out now. Um, I don't know how the campus manager felt about that, but like, you know, just, and that means like your time there, no one in the game industry cares if you have a piece of paper saying you're a game designer, right? Yeah. But what they care about is like the networks you've built, the games you've already made, your kind of standing in the community. Just like if you're a musician and you need a drummer for your band, you're not checking CVs. You're asking your mates, hey, do you know a drummer? Like, and it's exactly the same in kind of the indie side of the game industry, like maybe less so in AAA, obviously, but AAA is, AAA is a very limited part of game development, like yeah. globally speaking. Um, so just trying to get them on board with that way of thinking, that way of, um, I guess, participating in the local community and that way of like developing their own craft, like just start making stuff and start getting out of it, out there. And just quickly, I guess, the counterpoint to that is that, you know, if you read like Angela McRobbie's work and Be Creative and other kind of very critical cultural industries people, how much is that just setting people up to be this kind of endless hustle, kind of um, precarious existence of like, how much is me telling my game developers, you're not going to walk out of this degree and get a job kind of encouraging that precarious situation rather than um, um, fixing it, I suppose. But um, I don't know. It's, it's There's no straightforward answer to it, but that's kind of how I try to approach it. Yeah, there, there, there certainly isn't. But no, that was a really good answer. I, I mean, I some of what you said there sort of echoes my own experience uh, doing kind of my film degree, but it wasn't a practical degree. It was a um, kind of media theory degree almost at, at Glasgow. Mm. And they definitely had to contend with the precarity, especially up in the Scottish sector. Mm. Um, I'm actually going to go slightly out of order. Sorry if you hear any background noise, just the joys of working from home. <laughs> but uh, I'm actually going to go slightly, slightly out of order in my question because I'm really enjoying this this, um, this this overall theme in the conversation. Um, so what you what you mentioned there in terms of the transferable skills, that's something I'd like to expand upon a little bit more. So as a scholar who has looked so much at the practices of non AAA developers, how do you think kind of shape students can approach games development for the first time? What what roles mm. do you see them as being able to be trained in, or uh, as having those what uh, as having those transferable skills in? Yeah. Um, look, in terms of like getting started with with game development, for me, I think because I often have like parents ask us about teenagers and whatnot, and it's like we'll just just start making games yeah. essentially, <laughs> right? Like do do all of it. So like. For, for me, even asking what roles is almost um, premature, I suppose, yeah. in the way of like, um, and again, I keep using music analogies despite having no ability at music whatsoever. So I keep waiting for just a music theorist to just appear and be like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> but I imagine if you're like getting into music as a kid, you're going to play, try out a bunch of different um, um, instruments. You're going to just like download guitar tabs and do Nirvana, come as you are or whatever, because it's really easy. That's as far mm-hmm. as I got. <laughs> um and like and eventually you're going to try to play your own music and it'll be terrible and like and again like that's exactly how you start getting into game development you just start making games those games are bad and then they're very derivative and you start making other games and and so because of like again that aggressive formalization thing the problem with kind of newcomers to game making is often and this is less an issue now but it was very much an issue for the 90s and 2000s the games that are seen as legitimate games are the big triple a games and so you're like, well, I can't make that. So I, I don't know how to make games because I can't make the big AAA games or the big commercial indie games. And because there's the whole underbelly of like, which is 90% of the actual activity happening around games, which is derivative little trashy things, 
And like, that's where you start. And that's where everyone who made those AAA games and who made those commercial indie games started as well. And so that's kind of changed a lot because now you can just download Unity, you can just download Unreal and just play around with it um, and, you know, start. And, and the trashy stuff is much more visible than it once was, um, much to the anxiety of a lot of kind of gamer communities out there. But it means you can, you can kind of see what you can start with a lot easier, um, which isn't in any way a direct answer to your question. But then in terms of like transferable skills more broadly, once you start doing that, I, I, I mean, like, just simply, I guess, like, you know, game engines are, I don't even call themselves game engines now because these software want to be seen as very um, broadly used in kind of all sectors of the economy, right? So if you can use Unity, if you can use Unreal, you know, you could work at a VFX studio. You could, I was talking to people in um, Rotterdam, I think, who are like doing, like students were doing Unity projects for like some like freight shipping companies at the docks because these game engines, they do interaction and they do like, real world not real world like 3d world rendering kind of out of a box you know lighting switches physics all of this stuff which you know your cads are doing and so like there's a lot of anyone who's interested in kind of 3d simulation or virtual reality or just complex interactive systems are probably going to be downloading one of these game engines um and so if you've learned kind of how to use those game engines and you've got even as a designer not necessarily a programmer that's like an increasingly transferable skill to use there. Um, have any, I don't know, spreadsheets. It's like, it's a boring one. It's, it's not very sexy, but like just the spreadsheet skills I've got from just my hobbyist game development has done wonders to my academic career. So um, there's that. So I don't know if that's my answer. No, that's a good answer. That's the thing. Like, I've been having to learn spreadsheets as well very recently as part of my academic job. So there you go. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, so one of the subjects that you touched on previously um, was um, the idea of, kind of cultural legitimacy. And so I'd like to come back to that mm -hmm. now. Um, in discussing the, the idea of kind of cultural capital in your book, you also discuss the concept of cultural legitimacy. Uh, in scholarship mm -hmm. concerning educational games, there's a label that is used, serious games, which is used mm -hmm. to distance certain kinds of games from the tropical, from the typical triple A fare in the commercial sector. Uh, this may be a bit of a leading question here, but do you think that is a useful label in the end when trying to promote games as a valuable medium for research and education? Yeah. I mean, look, it, it makes it makes total sense to, to use it. And from a like, um, again, Bordeaux kind of way of thinking about it, it's very much a, pos it's a positioning act in the field, right? Like, like every cultural producer in a field takes a position. That position is very much defined by not being all the other positions, you know, like alternative being the most literal or indie being the yeah. most kind of being very literal examples. And mm -hmm. serious games does exactly that thing. It's like, we're not just for entertainment. Like you've got yeah. these preconceived notions about the games your kids are playing. Well, this is serious. And like um, that obviously can sound very, I don't know, insulting or come with different connotations, but like mm -hmm. it also makes total sense as a kind of, as a marketing tactic, I suppose. Yeah. Um, a lot of developers I spoke to, and again, this is like five years ago now, it doesn't <laughs> seem to have really, it hasn't really caught on, but we're trying to use applied games rather than serious games oh, course, as a way yeah. of like, of thinking about it as like, again, like fit me thinking with Venn diagrams in fields is like you're in the field of games and you're applying these kind of skills and ideas outside mm -hmm. of that field into a marketing company or into an education context or, or whatnot um and and so that's interesting i like that idea it hasn't really caught on yet um i guess like the broader kind of critique i have of serious games and this idea of the serious i guess of the serious game industry is like might be a bit spicy but i, I guess like if you go, go back to it. like the nike of like you know you've got the media panic a game's causing violence games are causing mortal kombat's bad murder simulators etc the serious games kind of side of things I see is essentially just like exactly the same argument, but like reframed as a positive rather than a negative. Yeah. Um, on, on both sides, it's really games are good propaganda. Um, games are a really good way to teach people things. And look, they are like, that's undeniable. But like, I think often they make, they, they kind of often rest on the same kind of exceptionalizing of games and they often rely on the same kind of, um, um, I guess like psycho psychologizing is that a word of games which like yeah as a humanities academic I probably have like disciplinary abrasiveness too which is probably unfair but like I, I guess like a lot of like yes games are really good at expressing ideas yes games are very good at um 
communicating or representing ideas about the world just like all art is I guess like I wouldn't say games are exceptionally better just because they're interactive and even I mean my previous work are very critical of even the idea of interactivity um you know film's very good at it and yeah. and you know just as previous cultural studies researchers have said about radio and about film and about art like this can be used for good or evil so a lot of the rhetoric that says you know especially around kind of the games for change kind of movement particularly and and I think this stuff has gotten a bit more nuanced in recent years but like when we talk about games games are either games can either do good social change and bad social change or they can do neither we can't have one or the other and it makes total sense if you're working in the sector of serious games if you're working at a serious games company or um what have you then of course you need to advocate for the positive aspects of it like for your company that makes absolutely total sense um in the academic sphere I guess and for me very much coming from like a cultural studies background I want to understand both how can games work as like good propaganda and as bad propaganda in the exact same way we understand film is very good at doing both of those so I guess a more critical understanding of just how can the world be represented or misrepresented in these kind of complex texts um I guess I'm rambling now, but I guess the short version is I always get concerned about serious games, reduces games to um, being instrumental as just yeah. objects or tools rather than complex media, cultural texts or artifacts. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that was a great answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to shift the, the theme slightly here. So um, given that a central output of um, Dr. Wong's Innovators Assemble project is the game seven, uh, which will be launching on May 19th. Um, mm -hmm. it will which it, it focuses on the impact of environmental issues on minority ethnic people um, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about the potential for games as a complex field of interweaving modes of cultural production to communicate these kinds of important messages in times of crisis like the crime like, like the climate mm -hmm. crisis <laughs> yeah totally um so I guess firstly like um I guess as like I guess with the whole previous answer being a caveat or something like games are undeniably good at you know, representing structures and representing kind of complex systems, right? And like, um, and, and that is how they often present meaning is, is through systems. Um, systems that are also visual and audio as well, like for, for digital games anyway, um, but ultimately are about when I do this, what happens? And like, obviously Ian Bogost has talked about that a lot as procedural rhetoric, which is still a very convenient term that I think captures a lot of value in it. Um, and so like when it comes to something like climate change, video games are obviously very valuable for just simply showing these kind of systems that are often almost inconceivable on a purely um, individual level, like these ideas of like ages changing or the idea that me not having solar panels is going to do this thing or, or what have you. So they can be very, very good at just showing these complex structural problems. So in, in, to that end, they can be incredible for... Um, you know, I guess raising awareness for for cultural change, um, for climate climate change, climate culture. I've just broken yeah. my brain. Climate change. <laughs> um, yeah. But at the same time, I think there's, there's some really interesting discussions being had, especially around um, a friend and fellow game studies academic, um, Ben Abraham in Australia, who re recently released his book last year, I think, um, Digital Games After Climate Change um, with right. Palgrave. Um, it costs too much money, but if you email him, he'll send you a PDF. Um, but um, unless someone from Palgrave is listening, then he won't. Um, but uh, what was I saying? But but in, he kind of makes a much more, I guess, kind of um, materialist, I suppose, argument of like, you know, you can make and you can make all the games of the world that say climate change is bad. But at what point, you know, the game industry, in addition to that, like there's still value in that. And Alenda Cheng in the US would say there's a lot of value in that as well. They have a very great kind of debate about this. Um, but would say like. Um, how are these games actually being made like like of, of the game industry more broadly how is the, what is the game industry doing to address its part in climate change um and makes he's got this really great provocation of like in a future where you know energy is rationed because for whatever reason well for climate change what happens to the video game industry um what happens to the video game industry when governments start banning 8k tvs because they're too power intensive or when microsoft says we won't fund, we won't allow you on Game Pass unless you um you know can can show us that you're like um, carbon neutral or carbon positive whichever the good one is 
Um, so I think there's really interesting questions there for the game industry to ask itself, which, which isn't to say awareness raising games aren't useful. There's a lot of value in those and it's a great medium to explore them. But for the game industry at large, I guess my provocation or other spicy take would be, because it's, it's getting late now and I have no, no um, guardrails, <laughs> is that like um, awareness maybe isn't en enough for, for, for commercial game studios, not for educational context of like, if Microsoft released a game of, of just um, um, about how the, energy, the environment's important, it's like, well, what are, what's powering their server, their server farms? What's powering their game development studios? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. We had to, we, um, so Dr. Peacock, who's on this uh, call, and myself actually ran a sustain, uh, game sustainability game jam once. And mm -hmm. it was, it was interesting because we had to do research as to what the biggest like impacts the game industry had in terms of kind of kind of climate change and, and pollution. And obviously a lot of it came from semiconductor processing. Um, but there was that sort of we had to run a later event which was on um kind of i think it was just kind of games and sustainability and the thing is they wanted some retro arcade cabinets but they weren't sure how to kind of how that was relevant to the theme but um matt mm. leaper was also on the call and he and myself were like it's obvious because the retro games they take up far less power and that was one of the findings in the sustainability games jam right like it, there's mm. there's been an exponential increase in how much Kind of waste pollution output that the image industry takes up now and retro games are almost like a bit of a solution to that and how kind of lo-fi they are and i feel like there is some parallels there between that that lower energy consumption perhaps and some indie games which again they mm. harken back to some retro aesthetics sometimes but they also generally take up way less kind of processing power to almost make as well. Um, so that's mm. really interesting. Um, so we're just about to get to um, the audience q &A. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, we're, we're really excited to get to them. So I'm just going to ask Brandon one more question. Um, to, to end uh, our interview, your emphasis on the cultural need to shift from pure profit and economic growth motives to acknowledging the importance of experimentation and creativity that goes into these artistic experience, experiences is really salient right now. And while it seems Australia is beginning to kind of lean back into promoting the games industry through monetary value and statistics, the indie games that provided its current foundation clearly had the experimental philosophy driving mm. it. And what are your thoughts on how best a community or society can hold on to the appreciation of experimentation and failure in the games uh, in the games uh, development process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I've, I've, it's a great question. Um, look, I, I think broadly what I've always gone back to, and and I guess my biggest, I guess, concern of a book or the biggest kind of caveat I keep wanting to stress is that I'm not just saying small games are better or hobbyist games are better or arty games are better. I'm currently replaying GTA Five right now just because I want something <laughs> stupid to play. Um, oh, one of your local games. Um, so um, um, I shouldn't have called it stupid, um, but it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, I play a lot of AAA games. I enjoy that stuff greatly, just like I enjoy Marvel films, but also sometimes want to watch something that's not Marvel. And so I think what's important moving forward of game development, just in local context and in national context, is just you need the full ecosystem. And and so um i guess the call of the book isn't simply just like abolish capitalism and like universal basic income and everyone make whatever they want for that would be great but yeah. but it's it, i guess it's more so like even within these kind of capitalist systems and society like you still need to understand the game industry is a cultural industry and that means accounting for this entire ecosystem of yes you need the large companies that can hoover up a bunch of graduates and like give them some like pretty tedious not that great jobs for five years where they actually get some skills and do some growing up and then you need them to have the opportunity to like leave those companies and then go and start their own companies and those companies that are in a town not because the labor force is cheap but because they grew up there and their family is there and they're not about to leave and go to another city the second that city is cheaper and so and so you so you have these like large kind of soulless companies you have the mid-size I suppose anywhere from like 30 to 100 or so who are like locally I guess like rooted um and um and then you have like the kind of flowering I suppose scene of just like messy kids making messy stuff who are able to do that without dying because rent is so expensive and who um you know aren't ladled with student debt or whatever 
and mm-hmm. and I guess it's interesting because like in Australia, which has relatively okay social safety nets, like they've been deteriorating for a long time, and it's budget night, so maybe they won't be deteriorating nearly as much tomorrow. But I'm not hopeful. But like the, <laughs> yeah. the the young people, game developers I was speaking in Australia were like, yeah, I'm going to try this project for a few years, and then I'll see if that doesn't work out, I'll go get a job. Whereas in the interviews I did in America, there's very very few of those people doing that because they need healthcare, they've got student debts which are just getting interest attached to it every like they're very consciously aware of like you can't just wait five years to see what happens um and and despite my previous quarter this wasn't some um anti-capitalist thing it's like <laughs> universal basic income is like the thing probably the single biggest thing you could do or just basic social welfare safety nets is going to yeah. help games in any kind of creative field hugely at that kind of lower end um but but if, but yeah, but you need the full ecosystem. You need you do need the larger, more stable companies that are driven more by profit than by creativity or, or the arts, um, because you need just need, you need employers, right? Yeah. And and those companies can also fund the scene to do its own cool stuff. So I think just just having both ends, and we've I think a lot of Australian funding folk have historically been very well at understanding the big companies and why they're valuable but hasn't so well done a good job of understanding why the kind of small folk are valuable. And that's become harder for them to ignore with like stories like House House making Untitled Goose Game or Witch Beam making Unpacking, who are very vocal about the narratives of where those games came from, yeah. um, which makes my job a lot easier as well, which is <laughs> great. But um, yeah, just supporting the full ecosystem as you would any art sector, I guess, is the short version of that. Yeah. Absolutely, bang on. Um, but yeah, no, thank you so much, for that, Brent. It was it was fantastic to um, have that little interview with you. Um, it was it was great to go really in depth on some of the things that you touched on in your book and in terms of like climate crisis and all sorts of different um, and all the different topics. It was great. Um, so next, we'd like to move on to our audience Q and A with yourself, um, Mark. I think we have some um, bits and pieces in in chat that 